Welcome to Powering Conversations, the interview series where we delve into the old and golden stories of some fascinating local characters. Today we are in the second fiddle in Belfast Cathedral Quarter, where I'm joined by two fantastic guests who have a joint love for music, storytelling and great whiskey. Welcome to the third episode of Powering Conversations. I'm your host, Ronan Collins, and today I'm in a very old building which has been given a new lease of life. Transforming old buildings like this and giving them a new purpose is somewhat of a speciality for my first guest. So please welcome Managing Director of the Biancor Group, Bill Woolsey. There are so many historic buildings that you have repurposed or just brought a new lease of life to. Is that like a passion of yours? It is. It's a really interesting process to get involved with, to bring historic buildings that have mostly either fallen into dilapidation or aren't being used back to life. But there's also a sound business basis to it. Because once you have renovated an old building, you know, the people of the city, or tourists love what you've done. You don't need to keep renovating so much because normally in a bar or restaurant, once you do a renovation uh, and it's a modern renovation, that lasts about three to five years. Whereas if you get a historic building, it costs much more to renovate it, but the refurbishment process instead of three years can be 10 years. I know that sounds really boring, but there's sort of two areas to it. One, it's passion and we feel proud of what we've done but we're able to convince our bank managers that it makes financial sense. When you talk about choosing those venues, famously, the Merchant Hotel was in the old Ulster Bank. It's a listed building. There must be quite a lot of red tape that you would have had to jump through for that one. The Merchant was a difficult one, but the Dirty Onion, which is behind us, was actually a higher listing. But on the Merchant, do you remember those bad years when property people were king? Uh, Their pinstripe suits and Bentleys. Well, None of them wanted that building because of its listing. And the more we looked at it, the more we thought the man who designed this, obviously for a bank, but secretly he wanted it to become a hotel because the conversion was relatively straightforward. And once the planners and the historical people know that your intentions are good, then you tend to get over the red tape. It takes longer, but the result is stunning. You mentioned the Dirty Onion. That used to be an old whiskey bonded warehouse, yeah. and now it's a bar, so it feels like it's gone full circle. Yeah, which yeah, is quite it, nice. it, it stored tea for one stage, and then it was a whiskey bonded warehouse. When we bought it, it had been closed, I think, empty for you know like 20 odd years, it was in real state of dilapidation. But it's one, I think, of only three wood framed buildings from 17th century in the whole of Ireland. As we really delved into it, the building became more and more magnificent and we loved everything we found. Everything we found was difficult, but an amazing product at the end. Contrast seems to be one of the great things about a lot of your venues in Belfast because we've got the National and then even Bullet and Burt. They've all got their own identity and DNA. Yeah, they do. Some of those cross all the age barriers. Some of them, it's sort of 20 to 25, 27. That's the age group. And the success of any business is if you can bring the generations with you so they understand what you're doing. And then as they get older themselves, they gravitate to some of the other places. The merchant, for instance, you know, it's not filled with kids. But some of the people who have been going to Bullet eventually end up in the merchant. And All our buildings are different, but they relate to each other. As you evolve and as the generations come through, each of them have a story with almost nearly every one of your venues and your pizzas, obviously, as well. We haven't mentioned that. Little Wing Pizzeria. We started that in the recession and that's been hugely successful. In pizzas, there's three sort of businesses. There's the person who gets redundancy or inherits money and they open a pizza restaurant called Scarface or Capone's and good luck to them. They, you know, they do their best. And then there's the ones, the chains, and some of them just load their pizzas with salt and syrup. You eat a pizza, but it's like taking heroin. You become addicted to this (laughs) sweet flavour. And we decided with Little Wing, we would put the absolute best product out there. And we opened our first one right opposite a national chain. And we've done very well. 
people understand what you're doing is value for money. It's a good product and we put back into the community continually. Uh, Little Wing has a you know a process where they go around schools and educate them about business and those schools come in to have a pizza and then we meet again in the school. So it's continually putting back and that's a lot of the reason why we've been successful. Giving back to the community, the Northern Ireland Belfast community, I take it that's something close to yourself personally. If you sort of go back to you know my childhood, I come from a real working class area. There was no money in my family, but my, my mother and father were old school socialists. They gave me my moral compass from the start. We've tried to involve ourselves with whatever community we work. Not only is that make sound business sense, it really helps us as people. So, you know, as the company's grown, or not only the directors do it, our managers put back in the community, whether it's clearing litter, going to local schools, we do work in prisons. And I think we get far more out of it than the individuals we, we talk to. It's a sort of two-way thing. And it's not driven entirely for business reasons. It makes us feel good about us, and that's important. That's lovely to hear. And as you said, it's not just business, it's personal. In a previous episode, we heard that the Powers family actually spent so much time in the community and with their workforce, not just because they wanted to for business purposes, because they actually felt more part of the community and the fabric of the land that they were in. If you open any business, it doesn't matter whether it's Powers Whiskey, pizzas, hotels, pubs, if your customers like what you're doing, that's the real basis for building any business. Far better than being aloof and not putting anything back. I don't think that's a sound, sensible reason for building a business. Now, you mentioned where it all began. You said you came from a working class background. Where was the catalyst to the Biancor group? Right, well, first of all, I, I had a career in football. That didn't work out then. My older brother got me an apprenticeship in printing, would you believe? I became a compositor. I was living in London at the time, and it was a bit like my school record. I hated school, and I hated being an apprentice. I read one day in a paper that there was a catering college I was doing a night course. I went along to this, which I hated, and I was going to pack that in, but they put us on placement. So I went to work for the first time ever in the hospitality, and I loved it. I loved dealing with the people. I loved the interaction. That's where it really started. And then I went to work with a, a real London geezer. <laughs> Soon he told me he was going bust, but he would give me an opportunity. And if I had over X amount of turnover, he would let me keep 10%. And I changed the restaurant around to something totally new. I changed it to a carvery. <laughs> this is nearly 50 years ago. I know Carvery may still be new if you're in deepest Tipperary or something, but this was 50 years ago. And the, the place flew. I had started to build a little bit of confidence. And there was a bar I could buy in Northern Ireland. And it'd been for sale for 150000 And it dropped to 50000 My mum and dad lent me their life savings, which was about £7,000. And, and I'd been able to get £3,000 from this place I ran and great references from the owner and the bank lent me the money to buy this so I was clever enough to spot a bargain. I just forgot to ask why <laughs> and let's just say the boys had got into the place and nobody wanted it. So that was my first place I ran and it was my dad, myself, my mum and my then wife. I learnt more in those two years than you know, the next 43 years. Again, if you put back into the community as you're building, the community, no matter what threats are coming to you, the community wraps themselves around you. They appreciate what you're doing. We put money into boxing clubs. There was a bad robbery. We did a fundraiser. You know, the community may think you're a bit strange, <laughs> but they understand what you're doing. And let's just go back to calling them the boys. They sort of backed off. We started to get a, a successful business. So. My first business, I bought it. I was relatively naive, but determined that this was going to be my business, not anybody else's. The fact that you'd go through heartache for two years to then keep going and going, did you see that Northern Ireland was the place that you did want to always grow the hospitality business? Well, when I lived in England, <laughs> there were bombs going off. So there was no chance of me 
starting a business in, in England. And I didn't want to. I wanted to come home. After I'd opened my first business and it was successful, I was able to open another one where a tragedy had happened. I thought it can't be any more difficult than this pub. And that became successful. My story gets happier from here on. <laughs> I, I had one simple rule that we don't hide turnover or figures. We explain to everybody what we're making right from the first. And we do that now. We're a much bigger company. So everybody has an understanding of where we are. We have the highest staff retention by a long way. You get pushed along by people who want to do something with their lives. We expanded, they could become a manager, or we delved into buying bars for people and letting them become the tenant. So it's sort of grown, and we have one simple rule. If we buy something or open a business, will it be better than the opposition? And if it is, then we step into that market. It's not rocket science, but it worked for us. And it's surrounding yourself with those good people. Yeah. Much like at the start when you mentioned it was very closely family run, you're still surrounded by your family and business today. We are. My niece works for me and my two sons work for me. My wife works with me. My ex-wife works with me. And then, you know, as we've grown, we've got outside directors have come in. We try to always employ the best people we can, keep them with us, give them a sound business platform to build on and really, you know, let them get on with it then. We don't sit over the top of people. So obviously the bigger we've got, it's harder to maintain that culture, but that's really at the basis of what we do. It's fairly simple. I do a lot of work in, in schools and they always say, how do you do this and how do you do that? And find something you're good at and then work harder than anybody else. And it's, it's that simple. I don't get my mind confused with the latest business technique. I'm crap at all that sort of stuff, you know. <laughs> Computers, I've only just got an email and I wish to God I didn't have it. I'm not a Luddite, but within me, I have these simple rules that some people see as old fashioned, but it seems to work. You mentioned your community work in, your, in schools. Do students put themselves forward to work with you or how does it work? We go to schools and we do talks. It depends who it is. If it's Little Wing, it's demystifying business. If it's me going along, it's basically how I started. And you try to give them an understanding that life isn't like the X factor, where you're perceived as nobody on a Monday and you're a star on a Friday, that it does need work. We talk particularly to schools in disadvantaged areas. So we say that education is important, but it's not the be all and end all. You're, you're looking at someone who never passed an exam in his life. And that should not be a hindrance. If you apply yourself, you find something you're good at and you work harder. I try to say that our industry are constantly looking for people who want to work in it. And the days of the past, you know, the old split shifts and poor wages, they've gone. Our industry is hugely progressive. I talk about where we were from 1968 to where we are now. In 1968, the start of our troubles, there was only one Chinese restaurant in the whole of Belfast, and it was on the Donegal Pass. And there was enough Chinese people to cook the food, but it was we women from the Donegal Pass served it. My brother, who was a sort of cub reporter at the time, the editor took him out with an editor from the Guardian newspaper who was coming over to cover the Troubles. And they wanted to show him how cosmopolitan Belfast was. They took him to the only Chinese restaurant. And at that time, everybody in Belfast ate chicken and cashew nuts. So they went into the restaurant and the waitress says, yes, love, to my brother. And he said, chicken and cashew nuts. Said the local editor, what would you like? And he said, chicken and cashew nuts, and then said to the editor of the garden, what would you like? And he said, I'll have some of your spicy chicken and your special fried rice. And she looked at him and she put her hand on the shoulder and said, well, don't blame me, love, you're sick as a dog. And, <laughs> I, you know, I offer that story because that was 1968, one Chinese restaurant. Look at the expansion in our industry and it continues to grow. You know, when I was a kid, engineering and agriculture you know, we're huge. Look at the industries we have. It's predicted in 10 years' time we'd be bigger than both those industries put together. So it's 
the opportunity that our industry has to fulfill the ambitions of people who don't necessarily need to have education, driven, articulate, their background is no disadvantage to them, and we give that opportunity, and that, that's the message we try to get out to the schools. We do all schools, but we tend to concentrate on schools in areas that I come from. And that must be such an insight for kids in schools to hear, and also like quite refreshing for maybe those who do struggle in school to realise that there is something for them out there. Yeah. You know, and hearing from someone who is such a success, it's like a mentor figure for that. Well, look at us two dummies. <laughs> who would have thought? Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Who would have thought? The Chinese restaurant you mentioned, is it still there? Probably. Yeah. <laughs> Don't go past there's a few Chinese. It's the Chinese community. You know, or all around. So it's a vibrant area. You're not going to open a Chinese restaurant up there, are you? No, 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 no I'm not. <laughs> but it's a, it's an area that speaks volumes for immigrants that come to our country, how they enrich our society. Now, a lot of what we have been talking about has been Belfast in the past. Where do you see it going from here, or like how have you seen it evolve? It's changed dramatically from a political point of view. We have a degree of stability. We're never ever going to go back to the, the bad old days, ever. That's positive. And socially, we've been progressive. So that's changed dramatically. The population has got younger. It's a vibrant city. Outside businesses from law to tech have opened in Belfast. So all those are positive messages. And I think that will continue to go on. I love the city I was born in. I owe it so much. It's onwards and upwards from here. I'm not naive. There, there are obviously problems that we need to overcome. The combined wit of the people will always add up to more than dogged determination of some politicians to hold us back. It is a great city. It is vibrant and the will of the people does tend to push it forward. That's the same the world over. The people nudge the politicians along. And our lot need a lot of nudging. So outside of all of the business, what do you enjoy? Do you, can you still chill out? I still enjoy the, the thing that I probably get most enjoyment out of, football. I still play football. And I've now risen to the dizzy heights of playing for the Northern Ireland Veterans, nice. which I really love doing. So football, even at my age, I'm still able to, you know, hold my position and, and get picked regularly. I enjoy that. I have a couple of dogs. <laughs> I really spend a lot of time with them. You know, my wife and my daughter, my two sons, my family is, you know, hugely important to me. I enjoy music. I enjoy all types of music, you know, house, dance, electronic, jazz, trad jazz, trad music, Irish music. I enjoy choral music. I have really wide and diverse music taste. My dear, when it came to town, called it the summer of love. Burning babies, burning flags, a pass against the dove. Took a job to steamy down a corner street. Fell in love with a lovely girl working next to me. From her six eyes to run her face, and a little house surprised. Like a fox called in the headlights, there was an animal in her life. I should say to my little country see, I'm not the fighting kind. If you don't take me out of here, I'd surely lose my mind. Cause she was your birthday. Why is the bees waiting? So I never let the wind in my glory away. As she was a lost child. She was run away. She said, so long as there's no price to love by all day. She wouldn't want me any other way. She wouldn't want me any other way. A lot of people my age think that music ended with ABBA, <laughs> you know, and, and they're, they're stuck in that. Whereas I understand music goes right back hundreds and hundreds of years and there's fantastic music comes from all those centuries. But I also know that it doesn't stop with my generation, that every generation that comes along produces some exceptional music and that enriches my life but it also helps when we're planning businesses because we have totally diverse music from all our diverse premises and it plays a hugely important part in attracting 
the customers that we want. You get the music wrong, there's no recovery from that. You have to really think long and hard, who is your customer? What sort of music would they like? And then try to push the boundary just a little bit ahead of them. Now, you mentioned your eclectic music taste. We're in the music room in the second fiddle, which is drastically different to some of the music we might hear in Burt's or even Rattlebag. That obviously stems from your love of it. So is music the number one thing you see in a venue or how do you run all these different venues so well? Well, the second fiddle, you know, the name lets you understand there's going to be music played here. So music's very important here. Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, we have live music. So it's the main driver here. In other venues, music, live music may only come on two or three times a week. And in some venues, cocktail bars, for instance, it's the background music we would choose. And then usually as the night progresses, so the daytime playlist will be different to the nighttime playlist. So different music meets the needs of different markets. Mm -hmm. But I would spend forever, you know, my friend Kieron, we would spend hours discussing one track, spend a lot of time choosing music. Yeah. And an inordinate amount of time getting the music right. I suppose people are responding well to how you have curated the music for that venue. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if they don't comment about it, that that's quite good, but others do. And, mm -hmm. you know, you can go in some places and they're asked what the playlist is. Could you give them the playlist? So it all adds to the customer's experience mm -hmm. and it all adds to our competitiveness against our competitors. Mm -hmm. Do you play any music yourself? I don't, I'm afraid. I used to sing with a, you know, a little band. And then I realized that I was sort of delving into an area I didn't really want to go. It was at my heart. I love. I love listening to songs that other people have forgotten about. I love going to some of those bars that a man or a woman will get a bit of silence and sing a song. And to me, that's a great night out. So you pick up those songs as you go along. And the good thing is, if I sing them, they're so unusual. Nobody knows when I get the words wrong. <laughs> so which is it's quite handy. And when I get the tune wrong, they don't know either. Mm. I think it's something that is deep within our Irishness, music storytelling, having no regard at all for the facts. I think that's the difference between the Irish and the, the English. The English people tell the story, it tends to be factual. When Irish people tell the story, we don't give a toss about the facts. <laughs> Being a bore is the biggest crime. And I think that's something that each generation has picked up. A gentleman was passing by. He stopped for a drink for he was dry. At the well below the valley, oh, green grows the lily, oh, right among the bushes, oh. He says to her, you're swearing wrong, six fine children she'd had born at the well below the valley, oh, green grows the lily, oh, right among the bushes, oh. If you be a man of noble fame, you'll tell me what'll happen to me at the well below the valley. I'll be seven years a ringing a bell, but the Lord above will save me from all this hell. Green grows the lily, oh, right among the bushes. Green grows the lily, oh, right among the bushes. Oh. Our nation has this deep, deep well of brilliant musicians, singers, and great young people who come in to work in our industry or friendly, open to a bit of banter with the customer. Each generation coming forward is better than one before. Mm. I have so many people who work for me better than me, but <laughs> I don't, hopefully that won't go out on camera. So, Bill, you know what? We mentioned a lot about singing in these songs. Do you have one for us? There's lots of Belfast songs. So there's a song about the Springfield Road that the people in the Springfield Road mightn't even know, but there used to be a cotton mill there. I'll give that a, a lash. I took my love out for a walk in the merry month of May. The birds were singing sweetly as they went along their way. She said she loved me dearly, and to me she will be true. If you will stay with me, me love, sure I will stay with you. We stroll along the dam, 
The birds cry loud and gay. Was there I met me pretty Burnett? She stole my heart away. Her cheeks are red as roses and her skin is white as snow. She was a darling of my heart and the pride of the Springfield Road. And now we are to marry, for she has named the day. And happy we'll be together as we go along our way. Of a tidy little house and a garden for to till. And we bring our children up like us to work in the cotton mill. We stroll along the dam. The birds cry loud and gay. Was there I met me pretty Burnett. She stole my heart away. Her cheeks are red as roses and her skin as white as snow. She was a darling of my heart and the pride of the Springfield Road. That's enough. Oh, that was brilliant. <laughs> well done. Thank you. That was great. Welcome back to part two of Powering Conversations and Bill and I are joined by Kieran Burke, singer, songwriter, writer, artist, actor, and just a fantastic musician as well. And you guys work on music together in some of your venues. We work on playlists for Burt's, like I say, we agonize over each track, but Kieran very much is the man who gets the musicians and coordinates the whole thing. That's all Kieran's work. And you play in Burt's as well. Yeah. So you're a pianist by trade. I should be really good. I, was, I started <laughs> when I was six years old and I'm quite good, you know. So yeah, I sing. I sing and play. Sometimes if I'm lucky, I, I get a better piano player in and I just stand there and sing. For economic reasons mainly, I play piano and sing. So maybe in a group of four, double bass, drums, one brass, and me on piano and vocals. That's all the jazz influence in your music. The music I write, yeah, there's always been a jazz influence. My family were in the theatre, so all the jazz songs, these old songs that all the jazz musicians are, keep playing, none of the playlists seems to have changed since the 40s. So I knew all those songs because my parents, they come from shows, Broadway shows and things like that. So I had a good start. I had all these lyrics in my head since I was about seven. But I don't particularly approve of the fact that all the jazz is still dealing with songs that have been written for 50 years. But that's another... Don't get me started. <laughs> you can evolve while still having the heritage of the past. You can actually bring it more modern. That's yeah. the idea, to, mo to move forward, yeah. If Jimi Hendrix had been predicted in, in the 40s, somebody would have said, oh, that's where jazz has gone. Excellent. It's progressed. So you mentioned your parents as creative influences. Did they work in music as well? Yeah, my, my dad was an actor. We also had a costume shop. And some of the uncles were great impresarios and big characters. My mum, though, was a, she was a, an opera singer. So was her mother. So the real music, I better not say, the, the very, if any of the family are watching from my father's side, but the music came from my mother's side. The drama, if you like, was from my dad, yeah. And that was down in Dublin? Yeah, yeah. So what brought you north of the border? I came for three months to work in a place called Larry's Piano Bar. It was called Cafe Orleans at the time. Then the guy who owned it, Larry Lawrence Delaney, changed it to Larry's Piano Bar. Did you ever think of doing that? You know, build? No, build no, no, <laughs> never, never. Unfortunately, the place was bombed. I was kind of picking pieces of glass out of my arm and wondering why there was no warning and stuff like that. So you were there while it went off? Yeah, yeah. One bomb had gone off, so that we gave everyone a drink in the house, and the, the, a policeman came in to me and said, uh, will you make an announcement quickly? We think there's another bomb outside. So I, I was about to do it. Larry ran over. He said, there's a bomb out there. What are you doing? So the policeman said, you know, the usual thing. He said, no, we'll go out the back. I nearly didn't get out because there was a lady called Norma who I knew. We are in a fledgling relationship that never went anywhere, but she was in the ladies. So I went into the ladies and I said, Norma, there's another bomb. And she said, go on out of that. She said, no. She said, Karen, you're a terrible man. All that. I said, no, seriously. I said, you've got to come out. There's a bomb. So eventually I got her out. Sadly, one policeman was waiting for us all to get out. And I think he was the last out. And he kind of flew out the door. I believe he was injured. Otherwise, nobody was injured. I was wondering, you know, what bus would I take home the next day? And Larry says... Don't worry, we'll open again. He said, we'll be open by November. It was August, and sure enough, he did. So I used to tell people, they'd say to me, what are you doing here? I'd say, oh, I'm just here for three months. I, I found myself saying that after about three years, and then I realized, no, I'm here. And you're a full-time pianist the whole time in Belfast? Yeah. I don't know if that's a, more like a ringmaster in Larry's. People used to dance on the table. So, But yeah, I was playing the piano and screaming out songs. It was unique 
you know, they were difficult times. Not only was it particularly unique in Belfast that time, the whole Larry's, I went there a few times, would have been unique in any city. <laughs> to say it was lively would be an, an under... Did you stand on the tables? That was not me standing on the table, <laughs> no, no. I was under your piano. That was you? Yeah, that was me. <laughs> Operating those foot pedals. Thank you about that because yeah. it's hard to coordinate everything, you know. So Larry's almost changed the whole perspective of where your life was going. I guess it did because I was going to move, move to Spain. I had I had a plan, but in those days the money was good in music in Belfast. I think it's I think it's still the same money now. <laughs> I don't agree with that. <laughs> that. Cut. So having played in Belfast since the 90s, you must have been in some fantastic venues and probably met some interesting characters or even played for them along your time. I remember one night I was playing in this piano bar. Van Morrison and Bob Dylan walked in together. I was just singing blues, blues, and you know, people were coming up and say, you have to do Van Morrison songs, you'll have to do Bob Dylan songs. I felt a little bit under pressure. And then this guy, big guy, obviously a roadie or a bodyguard or something, says, they love what you're doing. They just love it. Do just what you're doing. So I, that was great. I could just keep doing the songs that I knew. And then they went out. The next day, I heard that Dylan couldn't perform his concert. He had food poisoning. <laughs> That's, that was the last I heard of either of them. To be honest, I haven't, I haven't met them since. But. So Belfast has obviously changed quite a lot from working on your own as you come up to you guys meeting. Like, How did this partnership Come about? We met quite a long time ago. I'd been in Larry's and obviously New Kieran. I wanted to start a jazz bar. I wanted it to be a jazz bar that went seven days a week, but there were only four jazz bars in the whole of the UK and Ireland that go seven days a week. So that was quite ambitious. And we're a city of 270,000 population, not 12 and a half million. So Kieran and I talked about what it should look like and there was a place in New York that I had spotted and I wanted to have that sort of feel. We both started off with an understanding that Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday might be a struggle. I had to not only convince Kieran that the musicians may be playing the very few people, but I had to battle with my finance director to let him understand that if we just kept with the tough years, things should pick up. There's not much going on those days. Small city, people know if they come to Burt's, there'll be something going on. Mm -hmm. And Kieran not only got the right musicians, but had an understanding of what music we should play. We didn't want to be just dinner jazz. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Is there's snobbery in all music, but just a music that would be occasionally one step ahead of the customers. We're both passionate about playing music, and I think we're both passionate about our dislike of snobbery. Snobbery and, on all levels. Yeah, and it just worked. How do you see that the music has changed Monday to Friday, or even over the years? In the beginning, people would be in there asking, can you play I Will Walk 10,000 Miles or something? <laughs> or uh, can you do some Neil Diamond? There's nothing wrong with that music. You know, people were not offended, but surprised. But now that never happens. Actually, last night somebody asked for some ridiculous song. But normally they're looking for something connected to jazz. On Sunday nights I play with a band called the Sazerax. We don't do any of the old jazz numbers. We do anything from Coldplay to Elton John. It doesn't matter to me. We have a jazz sensibility. Even sometimes we do them off the, on the cuff. So somebody will ask for a song, we'll do it off the cuff. And normally people get, get it that it's not, it can't be Sweet Caroline or American Pie. But there are other songs in there in the mix. I mean, a song from Elbow we did last night. We have a great trumpet player, Lindley Hamilton, great drummer, uh, Steve Davis. So no matter what we do, it's going to sound like we're playing jazz. Somebody asked for superstition last night. That's easy. That is jazz. What's the difference between jazz and, and soul? So what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> you were answering it so well. <laughs> How does music move on? That, <laughs> yeah. that, I think you've answered it. The movies like, like La La Land was like such a famous movie recently. It won an Oscar for its music composition, but it was like, it was a jazz musical. Did that yeah, bring help, people to helps. the table? I mean, yeah. last, yesterday I played uh, the, the themes. Uh, this uh, girl said, can you play the theme from La La Land? I, I couldn't think of what it was, but I listened to it on the phone. Actually, it's pretty simple. Mm. And I just played it. Then I improvised a little bit in the middle and then went back to what I was playing. So 
She seemed pleased. She didn't realize that the improvisation wasn't the one that was in the... In it wasn't the a woman from the toilets, was it? Larry's? I haven't seen that. I haven't, then, seen, yeah, I haven't okay. seen Norma since. All right, okay. Regretfully. Yeah. Regrettably. I suppose Bert's over the years, those at Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, like hard struggle has now turned into a successful business. Yeah, I mean, on a Monday, we may be breaking even, we may lose money. On a Tuesday, it starts to pick up Wednesday, Thursday. Friday, fully booked, Saturday, fully booked, Sunday, good. So I think it would be hard to get a, something like Burke's working mm. in any other place unless the owners were passionate about wanting it to succeed and actually love the music. I, I just heard Kieran mention two musicians who, who play with him. They're superb musicians, and he, he has a collection of really talented musicians who are able to adapt. We keep our standards and that's important. It's really important. In Birch you also have a great food offering and the drinks and cocktail selection yeah. is brilliant. So the whole it, Yeah, the whole cocktail service thing is I think really, really smooth and professional. And obviously if you don't get that right, I mean it's a restaurant. If you don't get the food right, no matter how good the music is, if you don't get the service as slick as the musicians are performing, it would all fall down. It's, it's really something I feel proud of. It's something that drives my wife around the bend because any time we want to go out, I just say, let's go to Birds. There are other places we could go. And, uh, minor dispute, I win about 50% of the time. <laughs> even though it all seems improvised, even the jazz seems improvised, it all comes from a place of foundation, quality, curated success, almost. So, Kieran, you came up from Dublin. Bill, you're in Belfast, but you're going to be moving down to Dublin shortly. Yeah. Tell yeah. us a bit about that project. It's the biggest project we've ever taken on. We were able to buy the headquarters of Riverdance. We thought we were buying a Georgian building, which we knew would be difficult. So we knew there was a Georgian building with a Victorian building. And it turns out it's the oldest site in Dublin. So bits of it come from the 12th century. There's a St Mary's Abbey there, and we fall in the grounds of that. So I bought it nearly six years ago. We've been going through the whole planning rigmarole, and we're now just starting. So it's really huge, and it's a big thing for Dublin, and we understand where it is on Cable Street is the oldest street in Dublin. and We understand the importance of this historically to the city. So while it's been nearly six years in the planning, will be very expensive to fit out if we get it right. It really will be something special in Dublin. 100 bedroom hotel, a sort of large pub, very similar to the Dirty Onion, just a lot older. Two restaurants, and then there's a bakery that we took the walls away and there are the old Victorian ovens. So we're restoring that to a bakery. There was a 1970s building. We are able to demolish that and we're putting one of the biggest beer gardens. You get to these by walking down a Victorian laneway, which has been shut for nearly 70 years. And we're restoring the laneway and opening it up again to the public. The Dublin planners, they were trying to work out were we genuine, letting people walk through the laneway. If they don't spend money on our premises, well, fine. We obviously prefer they did, but the people of the city will develop an empathy for what we're about and that shortcut through the lane where one day they might be curious to come in so it's sort of all the things we've learned in Belfast when I came here first the uh, PSNI told me the footfall was on a Saturday night was something like 300 people it's something like 15,000 now and we're hoping that where we are in Dublin there's great little interesting places all around Cable Street and that we might be the catalyst to have future growth. Cable Street I think got listed as one of the yeah. best streets in the world. Yeah. It's just been pedestrianised. It's, a, it's, a, it's such a yeah. great place. And yeah, can I place. tell you something? We were told, and I, I, I spoke to Kieran about this, never, ever go north of the river. Always stay south of the river. We went down, and maybe it's because we're outside the city, we thought, this is where all the interesting stuff is. In Cable Street at that stage, there was a couple of Korean supermarkets, little interesting resident. There was an amazing little patisserie opened by a Canadian woman. There was a little pottery shop. There was a, a pawn shop. Mm -hmm. There was a brothel. 
and a couple of really interesting little pubs. It's sort of gone on from that. It, it is an interesting scene. I spoke to the people, you know, some of the people in Cable Street when they're going like, we're top 22 streets in the world, the sexiest street. F can you believe it? <laughs> Who the f voted for that? You know, and uh, almost they don't see it. And I, I know if I go to a city, that's the sort of street I love. Not corporate. No, none of the, the name players are there. I spoke to Kieran, he knew Cable Street well, and told me great stories about it again. We decided, yeah, this is where we're going to go. Is Slattery still on the corner? Yeah. They used to play at Slattery's. I, uh, I go to Slattery's once every Christmas with my really? We start at nine because it's an early house. So you go in there That's before right. you can. That's right. Yeah, this will be good. Yeah. <laughs> and there's a, the, the panty bar. Yeah, so so long, long yeah I, I played there yeah. once a week for maybe two years. Oh, wow. yeah, with That's a jazz cool. band as a bassist and, and with a band where we wrote our own stuff as well. And once with Shay Healy, the great Shay Healy, to two people. We, <laughs> we, we, we were trying. <laughs> I, we, we, I spoke to another public and he said, you know, you're north of the river. And we said, yeah, yeah. Uh, I was with my wife, and he said to my wife, you're never going to get the stun huns here. And my wife said, what are the stun huns? And he goes, you know, you look stunning, honey, and kissing each other. <laughs> You'll never get them north of the river. And we thought, right. The stun oh, huns, that's a new one. Stun yeah. huns. It sounds like it's going to be a class project when it's finished. Kieran, will you be doing the music curating down there? I'm trying to persuade him at the moment that, that it needs a jazz venue, but uh, you... I'm not as... Convinced that it, it would work, Kieran thinks I'm a fool because there's a big gap in the market. That's a stretch of fool, but they're great jazz musicians. We'd have them if we'd have them. Can I pay them a lot less than I have to pay them? We'd have to pay them double. <laughs> <laughs> so, Kieran, outside of music, uh, you also write plays. Yeah. Tell us about the last play you had on last May, was it? Uh, in the lyric, yeah. No citation. It deals with the uh, death of a piano man. He doesn't actually realise that he's gone. It emerges throughout the, the, the play that he, he was rather excessive in his life, so it's no surprise that he's gone. But he, he's confronted by the ghosts from his past, mainly the women who he has uh, disrespected along the way. Do you not think with Kieran's voice, the theatre is the place he was always going to end up? How about opening a theatre? Oh, my <laughs> You wouldn't lose too much. <laughs> During lockdown, you kept yourself busy by developing yes. a movie? It started with a lady called Eileen T. O'Neill. She's a poet. I didn't know what to do during lockdown. So I wrote a song about going to Paris when it was over. Eileen says, that's great. What are you going to do with the song? I said, nothing. I'm just, I was just, it was just Saturday morning and I was, I was behind the piano. So she said, I've written a lot of poems about the nature of lockdown and the pandemic. So I said, let me have a look at them. Such incredible poems. Well, that night I put one to music, and then I got the idea of oh, we'll make a movie. Composer in one house, isolating. Poet in another house. They've never met, but they communicate, and the songs will develop from there. So that, that's what the movie's about. They uh, write these songs, and in the end, one of them gets COVID and so on. And it's, I tragically ended it, but he, he comes back to life as a, as a dancer over the Harlem and Wolf cranes, which we managed to do. I got a very good filmmaker. So, Kieran, what do you think about Bill coming down south, north of the river? Do you think there's going to be a great appetite as there is up here for it? Totally, yeah, yeah. They, they, they need someone like Bill down there. And I'm looking forward to it. And who knows, there might even be a jazz venue, I don't know. Could be. Okay. Look, I, I think in Dublin, they're great operators. The difference is we've had a difficult time you know, since 1968 up. So, if you go through all those years, you had to work really hard. We didn't have the tourist influx that hit... Dublin, and Dublin has been on a trajectory of growth for a very long time. So, you know, now that we are down there, we're very respectful of the operators that are there. We will look at those businesses, see what perhaps we can do better and move forward on that basis. I'm just repeating the same old mantra mm -hmm. over and over again, but that's the way we, we hope we move forward. Working hard and yeah. keeping it true to what you do and doing our very best to get the local community around where we are to see how we can help them move forward, probably through the schools. You always need more mentorship wherever you go. Education. Education, that's it's the key. The, it's the key to everything. If you could go back to your younger self, what bit of advice would you give to young Kieran in Dublin or even young Kieran in Belfast? <laughs> get a trade. <laughs> <laughs> It's come to me. 
practice harder. I, it reminds me of an old blues guy. He was 98 or something. And he was been interviewed. And he said he'd have looked after his health better. Because he was in bits completely. If he'd known he was going to live that long. So if I'd known I would, would still be in this business, I would have practiced. Practiced another three or four hours every day to be absolutely the best. Bill, same question to you. If you could go back to your younger self, what advice would you give to young Bill? If I could talk to my younger self, I would say, stop worrying as much as you do. My, my mother was an Olympian warrior and that has spread to me. Funny enough, I don't worry so much about the business, but I have all these, you know, your kids, you know, how will they come up and are they safe from the streets when they're younger and all those crazy thoughts. I would tell myself to stop worrying, but I have a lovely wife, 11 year old daughter, two older sons, grandchildren. I'm really happy with my life and I'm happy with what I've achieved. Only thing, if I could just stop the worrying, that would be great. So the advice would be just go with the flow. Yeah. So, we, yeah, because other, if you don't go with the flow, if you change one thing, you say, well, that time in December uh, 93, if only I'd yeah. not gone to Spain that day, it's all over. Once you change one thing, everything might go wrong. So just go yeah, with the flow. Go with the flow. I'll raise a glass of whiskey to that one. Thank you. Thanks for your chats this evening. Thank you. Cheers. Bro. Cheers. Oh, uh-huh.